You ready, Mace? Party people in the place to be. Uh -huh. It's about that time for us to... Yeah. Yeah. What's up, chiropractors? This is Dr. Nick Silveri, your guide up the mountain to a million dollar practice. If you're looking for the roadmap to grow your practice fast, then keep on listening. This is the Path to a Million podcast where I chat with today's most successful practicing chiropractors. And remember, if you want to get there faster, visit GetMeMoreNewPatients.com to find out more about Leverage Media, the most comprehensive digital marketing agency for chiropractors on the planet. What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Nick Silveri with Path to a Million podcast. Um, I'm here with one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Alan Miner. Um, he is he is a brother from a, another mother uh, in that I love the entrepreneurial spirit, and that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was just your journey and and what you've been doing, what you've been up to. Um, introduce yourself a little bit to the to the audience. Yeah, my name is Alan Miner. Been a chiropractor for uh, 16 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, rooted and based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Awesome. So Alan has a rule. If he's on a podcast, got to have three drinks. <laughs> so we uh, had to no rush. No boring him. podcast. That's right. Yeah. That's his rule. Like he hates doing podcast interviews because he doesn't want to well, preach you, and teach. I'll tell you and, real transparently, yeah. most chiropractic podcasts, and I'm very guilty of this. I recognize mm -hmm. it myself. As a matter of fact, we have a podcast for our offices, and I realized one day listening why they bothered me and why they're so bad yep. is we're, te we're preaching to people. Yep. We're t it's like a workshop. Right. And I realized all the great podcasts I like to listen to during the week, they're just interesting conversations. Right. And I had this epiphany recently that, uh, huh. All right, we got to loosen these things up. <laughs> and so, yeah, I told you, like, I'll do a podcast, but we need to loosen it up. Yeah. You know, so so it's, yeah. Uh, it's like 310. And, uh, and I was like, all right. Afternoon. Well, let's, not afternoon, morning. right. So I, I was like, let's go get a drink because we haven't had anything to drink, obviously, because it's mm -hmm. 310. So we go downstairs, get a drink. And I'm like, let's drink one at the bar, and then we'll go upstairs with our drinks. And, uh, and then I didn't want to break the rules, so we had a shot in between. We did, and, so, yeah. and and which is uh, in no way am I promoting, but we're getting ready to launch our, <laughs> our, our vodka and gin company called Nickel. Which I'm excited about. Which is, so it just seems appropriate. Yeah. That's right. Next That's time right. we'll be pouring Nickel is my point of that. So. I'm excited for that one. <laughs> All right. So um, you have, uh, you had, you were a chiropractor, you had one practice, blew it up. You were, you, you grew it into a massive practice. Now you've gotten to the point where you are more entrepreneurial with it, and you have four practices in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and two in Dallas. Correct. So tell me a little bit about the the transition from practicing, because I think a lot of chiropractors that kind of get to that successful level are looking for, um, you know, what's the next step, and how how was it that you were able to go from from practicing and having to be there into, cause I know you still practice some, but it's really just because you want to. Mm -hmm. So how did you make that, that jump to like the CEO role? Yeah, I didn't practice for three years and I missed it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess maybe where I'll take this is I, yeah, I was really good at building a practice when I was in the middle of it. And as soon as we started to splinter that into satellite clinics, I realized really quickly, I really sucked. Like I, I had like zero CEO learning curve yeah. and, um, and I, you know, it's just, it's, it's interesting. I don't, nobody ever really sat me down and told me like, you have to understand if you're going to run practices that you're not in, yep. it's a totally different animal and skill set than when you're in there right. most of the time. And right. I didn't, uh, I had a lot of pain and a lot of <laughs> lost revenue and money learning that the very uh, hard way. And yeah. so, you know, something that I, I get docs that call me pretty regularly just asking about how to sell practices or how to expand practices or should just different just questions because we've done a lot of it. And something recently that I think is just very pertinent advice is you should not even consider opening another practice until you can leave your practice for three months yeah. and come back to it. And if it's doing reasonably well, you're good. Yeah. Should we keep going? We got that. Yeah, yeah. We got a, the, we got a the housekeeping. We got a housekeeper, right. So the point of that is um, if, if I would have left for three months, I would have quickly realized, oh, this, you know, th that business, the point is that business needs to be stable for you to not be there for three months. Yeah. Then you can entertain opening other offices. But like myself at the time, I, I couldn't have done that. And inevitably when you open another office, now you've just like 
doubled or tripled it, it's exponentially your time commitment. And right. if a doc leaves, and I can't tell you how many docs open other clinics and take what was this really great business that was doing well and just spread themselves too thin. And then the office crashes. And we, we lost two practices. $300,000 a piece is the price tag on that of lost revenue, you know, the build outs, everything. It's a very expensive mistake. So very simply, if somebody just would have said, until you can leave your existing practice for three months and it keeps running smoothly, yeah. you should not be allowed to even entertain the idea of opening another. Because what's implied in there, Nick, is you have systems and people in place yeah. that are operating it as a business and not as a job that you have to be present at. I, so. I totally agree. My first practice, um, I bought it when it was seen about uh, like 30 people a week. And I ramped it up to 40 people a week, like within a year, which is, you know, pretty impressive. And, um, and because of that success, you know, that, that 33% growth rate, because of that success, I decided to start that a new grand a month. Yeah, right. I decided to start a new practice from scratch in another town and work three days a week in one and three days a week in another with, you know, one staff member. We're masochistic. I, it's, it's, like, it's what, who would do unbelievable. that? If you had a restaurant, yeah, you wouldn't do that. I don't think. I, I would hope not. Um, Tell yeah, me about the. Tell me about like what. What was it like when you had? Because I mean, you're a successful guy, and I would imagine you were a successful guy when you closed down those two practices. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, what was that like? How did you like make that hard decision? Because that's a lot of. Because a lot of times, like I feel like people hold on because they don't want to admit oh, yeah. that it's gone. Very guilty of that. Um, first, though, I don't want to let this go unsaid. How impressed you were with my growth. well, no. Well, how impressed I was that you bought a practice. People, a lot of chiropractors, you you know, it's not easy to get bank loans. It's doable, yeah. but so what happens? That well, this was two thousand and six, so it was much easier. It was then. easier. Well, yeah, now right. it's not. But right. What people don't talk about is most chiropractic sales are financed by the doctor who owned the practice. When I sold it, that's what I thought. Yeah. So when you realize that the cool, the brilliant, we've bought a practice before and it's one of the better decisions we made because mm -hmm. there is instant cash flow there. And even if it's yes. only 30 people, you know, you would have, what you just told me the story is you would have grown from zero to 10 over the first year. But the fact that you came in at 30 and grew it to 40, at least it was a sustainable venture. Right. And like, I love that idea. And people, chiropractors don't, look at that I think often enough of yeah. just how smart it is to buy something that that has some level of momentum even if it's just 30 visits a week right. because of the cash flow because of the patient base it's a lot easier and uh, just nobody really talks about that much but I just I wanted to touch on somebody that. somebody asked that in a group that I'm in uh, should I buy a practice or start one from scratch and I was just like a hundred times out of a hundred buy one if possible yeah. because no matter what, it at least has something, even if it's just like the walls are up. There's a little bit of yeah. energy there. And now, now the challenge, I'll admit with that, it took us a very solid three years to feel like that practice had been 100% converted into our system and mm -hmm. our culture. Yeah. You know, we systematic, the best thing that happened to me when I bought a practice is we had one of the best doctors I've ever had the privilege of working with. And he's, he's our top performing doc. He's just, that alone is what was worth it. But yeah. Even with Dr. Adrian running that practice, um, to change the computer systems over, to change the financial plans, the adjusting, the culture, the tick, the chiropractic message, mm -hmm. it took a long time. The staff that was used to the old boss, like it's so there's pros and cons, but For it's sure. just, you know, I don't think anybody, A, ever told me, hey, it's a smart way to yeah, at least yeah. get going faster, but B, it's going to take a lot longer to really make it yours than you really realize. And that, fact, most, that is true. Most business folks say to truly change the culture, you know, if you do it in two years, you're doing it really quickly. So, yeah. but back to, I think the other question was, uh, how you made that hard decision, how to close them. Um, you not know, so, so much, not so much how, but like, just like, well, our story was we had this, we got a practice up to 1100 a week and I was in it and this is, it this actually, was your first practice. Yeah. Yeah. We ended up selling that, um, a few years back. For a good sale for one point two million dollars, so you can get wow. good sale prices That's on practices great. if they're stable business models. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but my story starts back. You know, I had a what I would call today a, a caregiver, somebody helping me as you know I was able to go grow, grow the practice to what I still kind of look back and wonder how to do it to like a seven hundred a week practice on my own. Mm -hmm. And then brought in a doc, and over the next few years together we got up to an eleven hundred a week practice. What happened was we had, you know, I, I had never had an associate. I didn't have good systems. 
we're shooting from the hip. And so we were changing things. It was a very rocky road up to 1100. And I think that dock probably after three, four, five years, it was probably burned out of working with me. Mm. Um, and really the smart thing in hindsight would have been to let them go and find another caregiver to come take his place. Yeah. But out of some perverse loyalty, I kind of thought, you know, what we should do is I should spin this dock into his own practice because mm. he's helped me build it. And we actually had a, a, a about 300 people, 200 or so people maybe, they would travel up from this community a little suburb south of Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. So we decided to open the practice down there and put this dock in it and give him his own practice. And it's just, you know, in hindsight, knowing what we know now about how to build teams, the writing was on the wall two years before I made the decision this was going to be a train wreck. Right. But um, the decision was actually made for me in that, in that they ended up, you know, after a little while deciding they knew better. So they literally op snuck an office down the street Opened up without telling me, had his wife run it, uh, then proceeded to steal our CA to go work with them and poach Yikes. the practice of patients. And by some miracle, I pulled a rabbit out of my hat and actually found a doc to come replace that clinic. And people loved him. Mm -hmm. And I think two or three months after he was down there, he got diagnosed with uh, lymphoma, oh, a cancer. And it was like, all right, we... we we got to close this thing. So yeah. it's just, you know, it was, we, those, those two, 250 patients we sent down, poof, gone. Yeah. The build out gone, the line of credit gone. It yeah. was just, it's so expensive. Yeah. And I didn't have the bandwidth because I was still up in the other practice to mm -hmm. like go back and down part time. So, um, in that case, that decision was very, just clearly made for me. Yeah. Um, and you know, what ends up happening more frequently is the doc will take the successful first practice and siphon off the shortage of two, five, ten thousand dollars a month to cover the other practice, right. and they're splitting their time, and right. it's just like, uh, I mean, a doc really has. You mean to... you mean I didn't? I wasn't the first one to do it when <laughs> no. I decided to do that. <laughs> it's just, so the, again, back to the point. If I would have said, I've got to get my existing practice running three months without me in it. Yeah. This would have been a different story. Yeah. Because then I obviously would have been able to step out of my practice. I would have had it still would have cash flowed. Yep. I could have gone and ran the new practice right. in the time lives finding something else. So it's it's as simple as that advice is. I don't, from all the chiropractic greats, I never hear people talk about these conversations. Yeah. And, and they're the painful ones that uh, we trudge through. Well, I this is a good opening because I think of you as, uh, I, I feel like you probably know more about um, employees, teams, making sure the right person is in the right fit than anybody else that, that I know of in, in chiropractic. So tell me a little bit about, um, for the people that are, you know, trying to grow a team, uh, maybe adding their first team member, uh, maybe they got a bad team member. Like what yeah. are the, what are the things that chiropractors really need to think about when they are, when they are hiring for those key positions? And let's talk about CA for one, CA slash office manager, in one situation and then an associate with the other? You know, for me, the answer, the funny answer is data. I really am a fan of running a business uh, off of data yeah. because when you're making decisions off your numbers, it completely removes emotion. Right. It's not like you suck or you're not good at this. It's just data. And the data is telling me something here can be improved or tweaked or modified or changed or maybe nothing needs to be modified. Maybe the numbers are really good, but um, I then figured out a way to apply that to people. Yeah. And I realized when you have data on people, when you understand people on a lot deeper level than what most chiropractors do, which you're just kind of reading a person's energy and vibe in the interview, Yeah. Like, which is why I'm such, we cringe at the old chiropractic group interview scenario. And chiropractors right. love the CA group interview. And it's like, there's a very specific person who excels in that interview, mm -hmm. which usually is not the CA you're looking for. And right. so it selects you to this, the total extrovert in the room yeah, right. who's going to wow everybody. Right. And usually those actually aren't the best CAs. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the ones that stay long term. Those might be decent marketing CAs, yeah, but not maybe front at, at best. And so um, I like data, you know, and so I want as much data on a, what the way that I've approached it then is let's, figure out the position we have, figure out what the person's gonna be doing, whether it's an associate doctor or a CA, 
And then like let's, before you inter- before you interview anybody, like what am I looking for? Yeah, well, you so that to, you're not yeah. you're not like being skewed by like who's in front of you. Exactly. And and then if you have data before they even sit in front of you, which you can gather. Yeah. You don't even have to have the interview because you already know on right away on paper. Wow, this person's a phenomenal fit. I want to talk to them. Or wow, this person isn't a good fit at all. I don't want to talk to them, but yeah. who knows? Maybe that person would have gotten in front of you and wowed you, and then you end up bringing them on the team, and they're not a good fit. So right. I'm a big fan of job descriptions, defining who you're looking for, building out what we call an avatar, and then using that lens to, to start to find the person that you're looking for and scrubbing who people are um, against that kind of data really, I think, has helped us settle down into – you know, for our systems and procedures and the culture of our company, uh, understanding who's a good fit for the different roles and why and how they synergistically work with the other people on the team. Right. And so uh, data is the answer. I mean, it's just, it's, and it's, people don't think of, you think of data maybe with your practice metrics. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are your conversion rates, your new patients, your average per visit, mm-hmm. uh, average PVA, but chiropractors don't tend to think of data in terms of people. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the really big tech companies think a lot about data in terms of people. And that's where we just adopted this concept from. So you, um, I think you said last night, you running 13 companies between you and your wife right now. Mm-hmm. So when you get to the point where you're running 13 companies, 13 teams, you're in the HR game, right? Like well, you, you, you are, you are dealing with, with people and people problems. And the more that you can have a pretty good idea of like, is this person going to be a right fit for what I want before you go into it? It allows you to go faster in the, the CEO role of a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I first I'll just catch you on saying you can't honestly say I run 13 companies. I own or invest in Fair 13 enough. companies Fair and I'll give huge props to somebody who really helped me on this learning curve as I realized, all right, I understand how to run a practice with me in it. Yeah. I don't know how to run businesses outside of it. And, and a couple of the people that helped me, one was uh, Rick Sapio. It used to be called Cairo Finishing School. Him and Patrick Gentempo started it. Yeah. Now I think it's called Business Finishing School. I, I didn't, I heard Rick, I, I probably did that program for a couple of years and kind of implemented what I did and moved on and forgot about it. And I heard Rick speak last year and I, I had this oh shit moment realizing how much influence he had over the way everything we do is structured now. Like it was yeah. phenomenal. So I'll start by saying, you know, the, the, the concept of how we have a holding company. And then what we do is we have, you know, partners in value creation. That sounds like mm-hmm. a business word, but we have operators, we have integrators, we have hardcore people who run these businesses. So it's not me in 13 businesses. It's me getting to sit with on a rhythmic weekly basis mentoring, looking at data, numbers, making decisions together with the people running these businesses. Yeah. So, you know, I provide capital up front. I find a person who who has the right avatar Mm -hmm. where they're looking for an opportunity that they want to run, but they they need help and they want uh, somebody to partner with on that. And that's where we can step in and fill that role. So I lost the question there. No, no, no. That that was it. Like we were talking about the 13... Uh, oh, I was talking about how you're basically in the HR game. Oh, yeah. Like dealing, like de- whether it's with your partners or with, the, you know, like the employees that are underneath the partners. I, I still think that having the, and my, my point with that is I wanted to kind of bridge into, um, you know, one of the companies that you run is Cairo Matchmakers and Ideal Teams. Um, Cairo Matchmakers, if I am right, is a branch of Ideal Teams, right? Correct. Um, and they are the, those are the businesses that allow you to help companies and chiropractic offices um, use that data that you're talking about to to find the right team members. So yeah. I want you to I wanted you to tell me a little bit about um, the PDP because when I took it, I was blown away. Like I've taken a lot of personality tests and like uh, I've done Colby, which shows you like what you're going to take action on. And uh, and I was it was the most the PDP was the most on point that uh that i've taken in the past and we use chiro matchmakers to help us in leverage to to find um employees and i just think it's i I think it's such a smart way to do it because it saves me a bunch of the front end so i want to know like how is it that you're using 
that data and, and allowing other people to kind of leverage some of these resources that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. All right. So let me back up a smidge. I gave a only shout a, out to Rick. Only, only a smidge. <laughs> I gave a shout to Rick Sapio. What followed up with that when I realized, wow, I suck as a CEO. Yeah. I've got to learn more about this is I joined a group uh, called Vistage. Mm-hmm. And there's different versions uh, in different cities. EO is something that I think you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, Vistage, uh, there's a Christian version of that called C12, uh, and there's a higher level called YPO. And what I started to realize, I got into Vistage group, and you know, I think you had to maybe have like a minimum of uh, maybe three million in avenue annual revenue to be in Vist, something like that. Mm-hmm. I think YPO is a little higher; it's maybe ten or fifteen million. And so, in Vistage, for the first, I'd always used chiropractic coaches. Uh, CJ Mertz was my original coach, and. Uh, and I've hired other coaches along along the way, but it was the first time I got I was starting to get to see the culture of really successful businesses outside of chiropractic. Yeah. And in my Vistage group, there was a two hundred fifty million dollar business, a few hundred million dollar businesses. I was the small fry on the totem pole, and I learned so much by getting out of our chiropractic bubble and seeing what other businesses were doing. And very quickly, what I saw was these larger scale businesses hired people back to what I said earlier, using data. They weren't just interviewing going off gut. There were right. so many more deep layers of analysis before they ever, ever even sat and interviewed a person. I actually had a, a friend, somebody I didn't know at the time, he became a friend, but we had mutual friends, and he had moved to Albuquerque after running a billion dollar tobacco company out of Europe that was a global company that did a lot of business in Asia. And he was responsible for assembling teams around the globe that sold these tobacco products, distributed tobacco products. <clears throat> His wife was sick and tired of him traveling the world. They wanted to go back to her hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's how they end up in our backyard. You know, he'd been making a seven figure salary around the world. There's no seven figure salaries for a tobacco guy in Albuquerque. <laughs> right. So out of sheer boredom, somehow Brian and I meet, we start chatting, and he's like, hey, can I, I, I used to, you know, I've got all these tools I used to use for this big billion dollar company. Yeah. Can I check out your offices and do some stuff? And said, yeah, sure. So um, he came in and measured our offices. And he gave me this report that, and I think this happens to chiropractors when you've done a Colby or Strength Finders or DISC or a lot of those you go, wow, that's really cool. And then you kind of put it in a drawer and you forget about it. Well, right. Brian went through and gave me this full report on every one of our offices. How people were made up, how the teams were comprised, what he thought would happen in six months, a year, two years. And I just went, wow, thanks, man. That is really cool. That's interesting. And mm-hmm. I put it in a drawer. Right. Actually, I filed it because he sent in an email document. And I was flying back from a seminar six months later and that practice had just closed and we'd actually opened a second a third practice during all of this and that doc had just left right and um that's a whole other story but i'm so i've now got two potentially failed practices in my original practice and this practice i alluded to at the top of the show that i just bought and i'm like i have a headache like oh my gosh what have i done <laughs> like you know the my first 10 years of work and what i'd saved and that quickly draining away and, mm-hmm. and I pulled up something like talked to me on the airplane like go look at that you know remember that thing Brian did and I pulled it out and Nick it was like I was reading a fortune teller telling me the future and Brian wow. outlaid you know he projected the office that closed had about six months of runway before and it, I mean he highlighted unbelievable the problem with the CAs the problem with the doctors the problem with business development like he just had a level of insight into my business and the guy had never stepped foot in a chiropractic office. And so I was also in Vistage then again, watching people use this data and it like a light bulb went off that if I'm going to fulfill and realize my dream of having several hundred offices, I'm going to have to figure out this behavioral personality thing pretty quickly Yeah. or else I'm just shooting from the hip. And quite frankly, I don't have a big enough bankroll to shoot from the hip. So, um, that's your, action, what, your actions were not meeting your, Aspirations, no, well, like you were just no, kind of like mean, making when, it up as you know. Have... <laughs> <laughs> like I would imagine the guy that runs the billion-dollar tobacco company worldwide was not like being like I like I like Bob. 
no. like I'm gonna I'm gonna hire Bob. It's like Bob. <laughs> they, he wouldn't even consider talking to Bob till he saw five pieces of right. different reports on what's Bob's cognitive ability, what's mm-hmm. Bob's behavioral makeup, mm-hmm. what's the role for the job. Now we'll talk to Bob. Right. Or, you know, I don't have a second to waste on Bob. Yep. So that's what got downloaded in, and that was kind of the evolution of of, of all of this. And um, I, like a lot of chiropractors, had seen Disc and Colby and Myers Briggs and Strength Finders, and when all those are interesting. And mm-hmm. I, maybe I, I just didn't realize being in Vistage gave me a window that there's an entire other level um, of, that really large multi-million dollar companies of, of these data kind of things on hiring use. The problem was it makes zero, you know, most of these licenses cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars Yeah. It makes zero sense for a chiropractic practice to, to use this. You've really got to be a big company with a lot of revenue, hiring a lot of people to justify. Sure. And so the cool thing in this whole process, you alluded to PDP, we were able to, to buy the exclusive rights globally for PDP for healthcare and tie those up and so you know we have this access to this tool that uh is is just even comparable to other high-end tools there's nothing like it for a chiropractic practice in three minutes the amount of we get 30 pages of information on people how they communicate leadership style what motivates them demotivates them you know all kinds of satisfaction levels there's behavioral traits cornerstone behavioral traits and so we can use that to, to then quickly match, all right, what's the role somebody's looking to hire? How's that work? So that's kind of the arc of that evolution of how we ended up, um, you know, having. And so now we have five different tools uh, that just chiropractors couldn't afford to buy. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't go buy a cognitive tool and a behavioral tool and uh, top grading is another license we own. You know, cool stuff that, like I say, multi-million dollar companies use, but if you're even doing a couple million a year in a practice, it doesn't make sense to buy these tools. Right. So we realized we purchased those initially just internally for our company, but I have enough friends and chiropractors that start going, hey, Alan, can you help me? <laughs> we're on our fourth front desk CA this year. Yeah. Maybe your stuff can help. And hey, Alan, we're, this associate is, is like our third associate. It's not working. I'm so tired of associates. What, can you help me? And at the same time, my Vistage group, I'd have people from tech and the the uh, craft brewery industry and construction and restaurants. Hey, Alan, can you help us with this manager position for the satellite office? And so th- this company, Ideal Team, was really never intended to exist, but it very organically happened from the work we were doing in our chiropractic offices yep. so that I would not lose my ass by opening <laughs> right. offices that right. were failing and having a more predictable way to ensure our offices were successful because of all the components of a business in any industry, people are consistently what give owners and operators the biggest headaches. And so when you start to understand how you can use data to make better decisions on the people that come into a team, it really does transform uh, transform business completely. Yeah. I the thing I the thing I probably respect about you the most, A, you're great, but uh, is just like you're so entrepreneurial and you're always like I just I feel like your vision is always bigger than just you know like a successful chiropractor with a brick and mortar like you're starting the the vodka and gin line yeah. um, you know your wife is a business owner and it's just like you've got that entrepreneurial spirit where you're always trying to level up and I always uh, always love spending time Thanks. with you on that stuff. Yeah, it's I'm back to strength finders. You know, mine I'm like a vision, strategy, ideation, like it's all If there's through. ever been one, yeah. like it's you like yeah, you're, the, I, well, I like you're who they stuff. were thinking but I'll, of. I'll tell you what else though is something I say frequent to, frequently to our operators is the glory is in the execution. And I have three I tried to open several businesses inside the chiropractic practices that mm-hmm. failed. We had a massage business that failed. We had a nutritional business that failed. And I still think this is the coolest name for a supplement company. We were Thrive Nutrients. We had a nutritional supplement line. Yep. All three failed. And it's because I I didn't have the bandwidth to operate them or yep. quite the level of passion I do for the chiropractic clinics. And I didn't have the resources to find or even know I needed to find operators to run those businesses. Yep. So... There's a lot of people in the chiropractic world who talk a lot, and it's even amplified now with social media. You can really make yourself look like a badass. Yeah. In a lot, you know, showing pictures of cars and watches and restaurants and travel. But I, I kind of, out of my own failures, gained a distaste for that. So I'm really careful that if we pull the trigger on something, we're going to see it through. 
we're going to see that vision through to reality because vision is one thing, but you know, a lot of people can talk. It's, it's seeing those things go through and turn into, into businesses that really ideas uh, don't pay the bills. They don't, like but money follows does. value. And so yeah. when you're creating a lot of value in the world and the money comes back in, it's really rewarding stuff. Yeah. So that's the impetus. And, um, you know, my mantra to my wife is, is the last couple of years is no new businesses between, uh, <laughs> We have a property company and we run an events company. My wife runs a ballet studio and we have a dance company that runs events around the country and the yeah. spirit company and the chiropractic clinics and ideal team. And it sounds like a lot, but it, there's enough in place now that any business need or itch I have, I have a place to scratch it. Yeah. I've just pro- make one of these 13 well, better. Right? I've proven <laughs> I can start things. Now it's like, how many <laughs> right, of these can right. we turn into a hundred million or billion dollar businesses? Yeah which is a whole different thing than starting. You know, there's, I always get fascinated by the guys, the Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates, the, uh, who's the Starbucks guy, Schwartz? Um, uh, Howard uh, Schultz. Schultz. Yeah. The guys who, the women too, uh, Chicka Boom, I was listening to her podcast the other day, Popcorn. You know, people who start something, It's there's a lot of people who can start things, but the person who starts it and then takes it all the way through to this yeah. multi-million or billion dollar exit, Yeah. Or turning it public, yep. it's a rare one. So I, I, I really love studying those people because you know anybody can have an idea and say they started a business. It's a whole yep. other thing to take it through the arc towards creating value in the world. So, For sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Alan, I appreciate your time so much, buddy. Uh, I, I love this three drink rule. I feel like I'm going to implement this for all uh, podcast interviews going forward. You know, I don't, I'm not a weed guy, but a lot of the podcasts, they're always blowing weed. And I'm like, there's something to this, right? Like, That's just right. get people loose. That's okay. right. Um, <laughs> I, I want to have you back on, though, to, to dive more into Cairo Matchmakers and how you can help uh, using that data, how you can help chiropractors build those teams that are going to take them to that next level. Cool. So uh, we'll have you back, and I appreciate your time. Bro. Thanks, Nick. Have All a good one, brother. All right. Just because this episode is over doesn't mean you can't continue your path to a million-dollar practice. We've created Chiropractic's most full-service marketing agency at Leverage Media to help you reach $1 million a year fast and continue to grow. You can get a free strategy session with me absolutely free right now. To get started, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com. Once again, go to GetMeMoreNewPatients.com, and we'll see you tomorrow on the Path to a Million podcast.